Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition Small Business Live Forum. I'm your host, David Dedekian, a small business owner here in Rhode Island. I own Eat Drink Rhode Island. As always, uh, you're watching this on Facebook. You can go to the uh, Rhode Island Small Business Coalition main page and join us from there. Go to rismallbusiness.org. You could sign up for our newsletter, find out what's going on with the coalition. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, but the best way to do it is to go to rismallbusiness.org and sign up for our newsletter, and you'll see all the very exciting things we have coming in the next few months. Uh, there's lots going on with the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition, and we'd like uh, all the small businesses out there in Rhode Island to join us. Uh, my guest today really needs no introduction. He's our, our senior senator from Rhode Island, Senator Jack Reed. Welcome, Senator. Well, David, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, and let me first begin by commending you for all the work you've done for small businesses throughout the state, particularly in the restaurant industry. But you, you have been someone I've, that we've looked for, uh, looked to for advice and for, for help. So thank you very much. And also let me salute the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition, uh, which has been a very powerful force in uh, not just the pandemic, but in many other ways. And uh, thank you for your leadership in that aspect too. Well, very nice of you to say. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, it hasn't been easy, I, as, as you know. I, you, you are, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things. That you're always right there on the ground with the rest of us. It, it, it's really appreciated. Uh, you know, obviously, there's, it's, a, it's a big role, uh, Senator of the United States. But you know, in Rhode Island, uh, you're, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to. I'm not trying to, you know, make it small. But you're, you're, you're one of the people. You're, you're here with us, and we appreciate that very much. No, I, it, you know, it, it benefits me tremendously because without your advice and your colleagues' advice, making decisions in Washington is much more difficult because we don't have the, the feel for it as you do, the insights. And I feel very fortunate uh, representing Rhode Island because some of my colleagues from big, big states don't have that kind of exposure and don't have the you know, able to sit down and just talk to people and, and get advice. It's, it's, it's very true. Uh, yeah. I have friends around the country who are, are you know, are, are, you know, very appreciative of the fact that we are able to have that relationship with our, with our Senator that they can't have in the bigger States, like you said. So uh, that's a very good point. Uh, shall we, shall we dive right in? Cause we got a lot of, a lot of topics here that are, that our uh, small business coalition members uh, are interested in and want to talk to you about. Uh, Let's uh, let's start. Let's start. Uh, you know, we've we've kind of we've had uh, interviews with uh, other members of our of our congressional delegation uh, before you, and the number one thing that always comes up with our members uh, is is the SBA. Right. And uh, you know, while there have been many plans um, and programs over the last year and a half that have been very helpful, uh, it didn't go as smoothly as 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 it, as you know we'd wish sometimes. Understanding that a lot of it was brand new. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, our members are always asking, you know, what can be done to provide more oversight over the SBA? What can be done to improve it? And and how do you, how do you feel that, you know, how, what, what was your view from, from inside mm -hmm. uh, at, at the programs and how they went from that perspective? Well, I thought the Rhode Island SBA and Mark Haywood did a superb job. I mean, I was on the phone with him at 11 o'clock at night, 7 a.m., you know, and he was there. And when you ask for help or small business approached us, they got it. Uh, um, but one of the problems was that uh, the Washington SBA headquarters reserved the rights, for example, on the economic injury disaster loans, the EDIL. So they were making those decisions and they didn't have the same connectivity that we had with the business community and with Mark locally. Now, Mark was doing you know, a lot of the PPP loans, you know, along with the banks, obviously. And he did a great job getting it out. One of the problems was uh, that we wrote it in a way that the banks could and did target their big customers. So the second iteration of PPP, we made sure, no, they were going after the real small businesses and other uh, minority businesses, et cetera, that didn't get as much attention in the first round. The other uh, big issue here with the headquarters down in DC was the shuttered venue operators grants uh, for PPAC and for Trinity and for others. You know, they couldn't roll those out in time. They had to delay it. And of course, there was an impact locally. But a, a lot of that is a result of the, the Washington uh, folks. And, and we are trying to change that dynamic first of all to get it staffed up 
uh, appropriately right. to get a director who is really involved with a small business. Uh, and also, uh, we want to make sure that the SBA, as I've said repeatedly, is responding like our local SBA. Uh, so the entire congressional delegation recently wrote to the SBA, urged them to modify its financial information verification rules for EDIL, make it simpler for small businesses to get those types of loans. Right. Uh, then we also, uh, as I said previously, uh, it changed and expanded PPP so that it was more accessible to the, to the little guy and not just the, the big enterprises that, that say the first round. And we're trying to look closely at uh, other things we can do with the SBA to make them more efficient and to, uh, and I would say honestly, to be more decentralized because the example in Rhode Island was of a very uh, active, very knowledgeable group of people who worked overtime to get the job done. And so one thing we can do is these programs probably should be run more from the local SBA and not out of DC and that we're trying to make that change. No, that's an, that's an excellent uh, idea. I, I know personally, and also from many of our members, uh, they were, they were a lot of times over the, over the last year and a half, like you said, Mark and his office were great, but we'd send an email or make a phone call. Uh, and the response was, oh, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not us. That's, that's the federal level. Uh, and you know, under, you know, that's how it worked. We understood that, but then we would not get a really sufficient response from the federal level, uh, whereas the, the local office would respond almost immediately. So that's a that's a great that's a great idea. I hope I hope that that can come to fruition. Uh, you mentioned some of the programs, uh, PPP. I think you know for the most part, uh, everyone was really appreciative and and uh, that worked really well for for lots of people. And and like you said, with the second round, uh, as a as a uh, sole proprietor myself. I wasn't el eligible the first time around, but I did receive an amount for the second round of PPP. So that was great. Uh, idle, um, I did not apply for an idle loan personally, but a lot of our members have had uh, less than satisfactory results with the with the loan program, uh, especially the second second wave of it. And uh, it, it, it's you know it, it, there's all sorts of notes that we get from our members. Uh, you know, it, the, the bottom line is frustration. I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, I bet. Yeah, I, I'm sure you, you've experienced as well. I'm sure you, you've heard you've heard those comments. Um, I mean, what what is there anything that can be done with those types of situations? I mean, should, you know, should should they reach out to like your office or, or absolutely you know, they should pick yeah. up the phone and call us? Uh, and you know, the, as I said, we were in constant contact with uh, Mark as you were, and we got results from the uh, those programs that they were involved in. EDIL at the federal level, is one of it was it was generally designed for uh, localized disasters. I don't know if that's right. a contradiction in terms, but, you know, and you now you had a nationwide pandemic where everyone in the country or many in the country were qualifying simultaneously. I don't think they were prepared, both in terms of personnel, in terms of rules and everything else. And, you know, they, as I said, what we have to start thinking about is getting those types of decisions pushed down to the local level where you really do have contact and you can make the case and they understand, you know, which companies are really deserving of it for many different reasons. And maybe there's another company that can wait a while longer. It's easier for the local folks to see that. So I think that's one of, one of the keys. That's an excellent point. Oh, thank you. Uh, and shut a venue. Uh, I, I I almost hesitate to say this, uh, but uh, I'm still in the appeals process. I, I still I check the website and I still I mean, in my opinion, my, my case is relatively cut and dry. I, I, I had a festival in 2019. Mm. I did not have a festival in 2020 or 2021. You know, I put those dollar figures in and I'm still I'm still uh, waiting for an appeal uh, on that. Uh, so. Uh, you know, many other members as well have had uh, less than successful results with shutter venues. So I, I hope that we can find a way to uh, well, push this through. Well, we're trying to do that. We're, we're, uh, we're actually, you know, trying to look at to see if we can generate a, a second round of funding. Uh, that would be great. We also want to, again, focus in on uh, some of the applicants who didn't get a shot, a good shot. 
you know, there's a legal case, too, that came up, which uh, put a hold on some of the uh, beneficiaries that we had targeted, particularly in the minority right. community. And that yeah. is frustrating because, again, once again, these are typically very small businesses that need the help and are important to the communities. So we're trying to work around that, too. Um, and then the other factor that we can't lose sight of is that when we did the CARES Act, uh, we, we worked to get about $1.25 billion for the state. When we did the American Rescue Plan, that was about 1.67. I think the state has about one and a half billion dollars at least. And the governor's always indicated he wants to set up something that can help local businesses to complement right. the shuttered venues and the PPP and also the, the uh, restaurant uh, plan too. And uh, there is also, I know Providence has indicated they want to spend some money out of their American Rescue Plan. So there are other ways to, you know, to, to attack this issue. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. You brought up Providence. Um, we, so the Small Business Coalition has, has worked closely with the governor's office, the lieutenant governor's office uh, on some of these programs. Uh, we, we helped uh, with the Restore grant uh, from from last year that, yeah. that were five thousand dollar grants for, for people, which was huge for small businesses. Uh, Providence, unfortunately, um, has has put some pretty uh, difficult rules on their grant program. And we're trying to work our way through that. I realize that's not uh, not something under your purview, but um you know, it, a, any sort of awareness of these issues, I think, is important for us to get out there and let people know that we are we are working on these things. If you if you do, you know, run into these problems with the grants that the Small Business Coalition is working on it. But, it, you know, it's thanks to the to 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 the senator and, and, our, and our delegation for getting the money into Rhode Island right. in the first place. But the, so, you know, to the point we made previously, you talk to the people that you deal with on a constant basis. They understand that it would be much worse if you had to communicate with an office halfway across the country, Washington, D.C., right. et cetera. So, but that's, you know, we, we hopefully they'll get the, uh, they'll get the money out appropriately and quickly. Yeah, hope so. Uh, you mentioned the re restaurant revitalization fund. Uh, is that still part of, I, I, I've kind of lost track at this point, to be honest with you, but I, I believe the Build Back Better bill has uh, some replenishment for that in there. Is that still, is that still? We are talking case? about replenishment. There's actually two separate bills and I'm co-sponsoring both. Uh, one is uh, uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund Replacement Act, where we're just gonna put in an additional $60 billion for our uh, Okay. And we've got 42 co-sponsors and it's bipartisan. So there's a chance. The question there is how, what do you put it on? Because it won't go independently. Then the, okay. there's another uh, bill by Ben Cardin, who's chairman of the Small Business Committee in the Senate. And that's the uh, Continuing Emergency Support for Restaurants Act. That's $48 billion. So it's got 20 co-sponsors. So we're talking about, you know, a significant second wave, if you will. Uh, the question yeah. is, how do we get it into a bill? Uh, and that's what we're working on now. Understandable. So, I, you know, I, I, this is a tricky question. I don't, I don't, we try to be a political with the coalition, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a Senator, uh, watching what's going on with, with, with uh, DC and in particular with two of your colleagues who, uh, uh yeah. seem to be the, the, the roadblocks to everything. Um, what can be done? What, 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 how do you see things unfolding? What, I, I realize I'm, I'm asking you to, to, <laughs> to predict something in a, in a situation that's highly unpredictable, but what's going on there? I mean, what can we look to? Cause I, you know, there are so many parts of these, of these bills that are vital to the existence of small businesses. No, you're absolutely right, uh, David. And interesting enough, when you take the parts of the build back better bill and the infrastructure bill, they're widely popular with Americans, Republicans, yeah. Democrats, Independents. This is not something, but we're in a 50-50 Senate and a very close House majority. And for us, we have to get every member of our coalition and the vice president to get the bill through. And as you point out, uh, Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema have had reservations. I'll be diplomatic. Uh, I think though, when we, we left yesterday, the president's framework has been responsive to, to, to their claims, complaints, criticism, et cetera. And I hope that we can move very quickly 
to get that reconciliation bill done. It would represent a significant increase uh, in support for small business, businesses of all types. And the other thing it would start tackling is in terms of infrastructure, obviously that's gonna make us more productive, which helps everyone. Second, in terms of uh, different than the physical infrastructure, the human infrastructure, issues that your colleagues confront every day. You know, how do my right. people get daycare access? And I've been in calls, can't come in because I've got to take care of the kids. No school in Forster, Gloucester. I can't come in to work today. So, you know, we hope we can build in a, a, a pre-K support system that will be very, very useful to all parents. And then also, I think we're, we're looking at the kind of training that you're going to need uh, because uh, a lot of uh, success today is based on the work skills of your your employees, not so much some some machine or something else. And that's something. So it's going to be, I think, significant. And the other aspect, like it too, which should concern all of us, is the issue of climate change. Uh, Absolutely. Th th this would be the most fundamental uh, expenditure of resources directed at climate change. Uh, a down payment, I will admit but a substantial down payment. And that's going to benefit all of us. Yeah, so no, absolutely true. Where, where are we? I, I think we're going to get it done. I just think we have to get it done. And uh, the question is just timing. The sooner the better. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it, you know, we're heading into the holiday season. I, I know that, uh, you know, there'll be recessed uh, eventually. And, uh, uh, the sooner the better, as you said. Uh, you know, it's interesting you bring up climate. You know, it's, it's one of those topics that always, uh, you know, draws a lot of, uh, you know, thoughts on both sides. But I think from a small business perspective, there's so much potential there as well. I mean, obviously, there's the the negative impacts, which you know, hopefully we can, uh, you know, take care of and, and those won't impact things. But I think there's lots of opportunity there when you look at small business and, and climate. Uh, you know, lots of energy opportunities, lots of new business opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, in this is a coastal state. There's going to be all sorts of, uh, you know, opportunities there in, in terms of, uh, uh, fixing some of the issues for, for, you know that have been affected because of the climate, uh, so I think yeah that's, that's vitally important. So you um, you did say you mentioned that, so reconciliation does seem to be the way that uh, this will be heading uh, to, to once. No, once I, the, there's two yeah, separate pieces. There's the infrastructure bill, which is the old fashioned yep. bricks and mortar, passed bipartisan vote, strong bipartisan vote in the Senate, 67 okay. votes. That's in the House now. That will pass the House, I, I'm, I hope. And and then the, the issue that's still we haven't sort of got uh, clarified is reconciliation. But my latest word is that the House will have actually draft legislation uh, soon, next week, I hope, next Monday, and that we can start working on that legislation. And once you have something on paper, it's a, you know it's no longer just conceptual, et cetera. People can go in and start making the changes or suggestions, and then that will move the process along significantly. Uh, and then it'll, you know it'll come out of the house and come to us, and you know I, it'll be a battle. But you know at that point, I think we'll be in a position to pass it. Well, that's 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 good to hear. I, I, good luck to you. I, I'm sure it's you know, like you said, it'll be a battle, but we we appreciate all your work. Uh, you you mentioned um, the two restaurant plans. Uh, you know, essentially, uh, one of them would be essentially a new uh, a package. Um, do you think there's any other packages coming along? I, you know, the ARPA funds have now come to the state, and, and that's being debated here on the state level. Uh, and, and you know, the the other funds, for, you know, previous to that. But do you think anything new will be coming along along those lines, or do you think we're kind of, uh, you know? That's where we are right now with with with. Uh, I think where we are is we're in a position uh, to let the states use their money to step into critical areas, and I assume, and I think it's accurate, they have probably a better understanding of what's the most pressing local need than we do in Washington. So we, you know, one of the, and this was a, a bipartisan effort. One of the things we did is literally keep the lights on. From yeah. you know, from the beginning of twenty one, all the way through the and the pandemic, so now we're in the position for uh, we hope a strong recovery, and the states are now in the position with significant resources to start 
placing them in, in areas that will help. You know, for some small businesses, it's it's an infrastructure project that would mean, you know, uh, making it easier to park. So, so again, yeah. it's going to have access, but that's good. For some others, it would be a program of grants and support for operational expenses and, and things like that. And at the local level, both the cities and the states, we should be able to do that. And that so there's a lot of money right out there that we hope starts getting into the economy quickly because that'll help us all. Absolutely true. Yeah, no, I think we, we've talked about uh, infrastructure, you know, previously on this program. And, and, you know, like you said, roads, broadband, all these things, child care, you know, all these things help to make small businesses stronger. Uh, you know, they, it, it, it's it's only, you know, yeah. a, a re reinforcement of their base, essentially, to, to, you know, for them to build up on. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things I think is going to help small businesses, and you mentioned broadband, is during the pandemic, so many uh, businesses had to go online, had to be virtual, had to, you know, restaurants had, you know, you order virtually, they deliver, et cetera. Uh, there are places that doesn't have the broadband to support that. If we have right. high scale broadband, 5G, and then looking to 6G all across this country, there's going to be so many opportunities for very bright entrepreneurs and business people to think of new ways to deliver products, new ways to to uh, sell the products over, over the Internet that it's going to be. And also, hopefully, to be competitive against the big Amazons of the world. Exactly. No, that's a very good point. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mayor Policino of Johnson on in a, in a, in a few weeks, and uh, obviously the Amazon topic is going to come up there. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's an inevitable reality uh, and, and, and should provide uh, hopefully good jobs. We'll, we'll see. Amazon has not had the best track record there. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's something we're going to have here in, in Johnson and some, you know, other businesses are going to have to deal with. So, But, um, it, you know, if, if they feel more competition, from small businesses that have the same kind of, or close to the same kind of electronic capabilities they have uh, and the websites they have and the delivery system they have, that's going to help everybody because the competitive market tends to separate the, the, the good from the bad, keep prices in, under control, and that's going to be good for us. And the innovation really comes mostly from small businesses, uh, and we want that. Oh, always. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it feels very strange to say, it, but essentially, you know, when Amazon or other, you know, behemoths now like that started, they were essentially small businesses that happened to bloom. Yeah, so, you're, uh, you're exactly right. It was, there, every big business was at one time a small business. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. yeah. You mentioned delivery. You know, I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this or any, any, any insight. Uh, the supply chain issue that, that so many businesses are facing, you know, everything from retail to, you know, restaurants to just basically every business really at this point. Uh, your thoughts, what can we do? What, is there something the government can do to uh, help with that? Or is that just something well, we, need to, we need to work through? The, first of all, the, the major cause is the pandemic. It, it right. has disrupted, you know, first we realized how global the supply chain was that you know, it, it might have on the box made in Iowa, but most of the components were made in China. So when, that, when, when they started slowing up production, it had a ripple effect throughout. So one of the first solutions is let's beat back COVID uh, completely you know, and let people get back to full time, to working, et cetera, that'll help. The, the president stepped in and one thing he did, which was uh, I think important was, uh, struck a deal with the Port of Los Angeles for 24-7 operations. And that was bringing that, yeah. the shippers and the longshoremen and saying, we're going to go all out and try to replicate that in other ports. Uh, this is a worldwide problem, too. It's not just the you know, United States. This is worldwide. We're having issues right, right. With, with, with truckers. Uh, a lot of folks, and this is a phenomenon that's not restricted to the truck industry, uh, they're not coming back to work. And it, it to me, I think of uh, many factors. So, but one factor is after being out essentially for a year and a half, people have been thinking about what are they going to do with the rest of their lives? And you've got people say, well, I want to go back to school or wait, there's an opening now 
in this industry because they have a shortage. I can go there and I won't be away from my family for seven days in a row, driving a semi around, et cetera. So there's lots of factors that, that like that. You know, had this pandemic been uh, 60 days, people would have automatically, I think, assumed their, their old job. They just went back because they had a little brief vacation. But that whole year and a half, and even now, it's, you know, do I really want to do this? And then you have the issues of childcare we talked about. You've got other issues. So that this uh, supply chain has to be resolved as fast as possible because it, uh, you just look at the automobile industry. Microchips are so scarce yep. that plants have shut down. The price of used cars have, have gone up dramatically. Uh, you go past a, a automobile lot these days and if you find like a fraction of the cars that used to be there, uh, and that's tough. We have to get that. That's a big part of our economy. We have to get back. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that one because I saw, uh, you know, in the news last week, uh, our previous governor, a, a, a friend of yours, yes. uh, it, it, along with along with infrastructure on the, on the bill for the for the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, the chips uh, are also uh, the, the the semiconductors are also something on on her agenda. Have you had a chance to meet with her and talk with her about any of these things? I was, I was uh, with her Wednesday evening, and we were chatted, and we, we hope to get together next week. She's been put in charge, and I think the president made a very good choice of sort of sorting out this chips problem internationally. Yeah, the the truth is, and again, this became apparent to us in the pandemic. Eighty percent of microchips are built in Taiwan, South Korea, and China. And when they have problems and, you know, in, in, in terms of factory access, in terms of other things, it's reflected worldwide. Second, I think some of the businesses make calculations, particularly when we went into lockdown in so many places, that their products would not be in demand. And so they didn't order the chips. Where other industries, I'm, I'm told the entertainment, the, you know, the, Xbox folk, Xbox people, et cetera, they bought lots of chips and, and the, the, the Apple phones bought lots of chips because they said, what else are people going to do in town? So there was this incredible distortion of the company's expectation of what they needed. But, the, but we have to get back to uh, increase production and then get that supply out to everyone that needs it. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, ordering, like you said, you know, products for the home, you know, really made sure they had all their semiconductor and chips uh, in place to build. Uh, I, it, we've seen that on the local level, too. I, I, I know that I've been in uh, bottling, bottling facilities here in Rhode Island, the beer and, and, and soda. And uh, if they didn't plan ahead of with ordering empty bottles uh, well in advance, they would be out right now because there are there are places that are finding it hard to get things like that. So right. you know, it's a worldwide problem, like you said, and I, and I think uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a little time to work out of it, but it's gonna it's gonna take some 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 savvy and some and some good forethought. Well, one of the things we're doing in Washington is we have a a, a bill called the Chips Bill, and what we're doing for both national security reasons and to ensure we don't get into this problem again, is we are going to subsidize basically the repatriation of chip building into the United States. Intel is already in the process of building a factory, I think, in Arizona. So the, and Intel designs chips. So they're the leader in the industry, but they're all built overseas. Uh, so right, right. if we start pulling back, that means jobs here. It also means a much more uh, secure supply line. Because frankly, uh, getting into my other hat as a chairman of the Armed Services Committee, every military system we have depends upon microchips today. You yeah, know, it's a very good point. Uh, yeah, even even you know uh, weapons, uh, infantry weapons, they have they have sights on them, and you know infrared devices that are that you know, some type of chip. Uh, so we're in a situation now where for security reasons and also for economic reasons, we've got to bring them back. We hope we can get that bill passed and we hope we can start seeing these uh, chip manufacturing facilities in the United States so we have a secure supply and we can be much more effective in getting, you know, uh, if we take a wrong turn in terms of trying to predict what's going to happen, get back on course quicker. Right.
No, it's absolutely true. I mean, a lot of these issues with supply chain are security issues to some extent. Uh, I didn't think about it that way, but you're, you know, it's it, now that you say that, it's it's a very good point. Uh, it, it's like, similar with some of the food system issues I work on. I mean, food and hunger can also be security issues. So, well, you know, uh, food hunger is one of the world's leading issues, and it's in the United States too. And part of the Build Back Better plan is to make sure that children have you know, right. three good meals a day, and that's not the case everywhere. In fact, what we did with the, the children's tax credit, which are remarkable, it, it was a, essentially one of the biggest tax cuts for working families in the history of the country. And it also brought half of children in poverty out of poverty, which yep. will, I think, hopefully be projected in terms of better diet, better better experience. Uh, that's one thing we've got to do. But if you look again, you know, put my national security hat on, one of the issues, major issues, is climate change, it affects the ability to grow products. It displaces lots of people in particularly developing countries. And that right. pressure is worldwide. And it goes to, you know, and the other, you know, our even our own uh, production of uh, agricultural products you know, with the water problems and irrigation problems, et cetera, that's going to put the price up. Absolutely true. Yeah, no, I've talked to a lot of folks on the West Coast that can't grow what they used to be able to grow uh, or have a shorter season. Yeah, that, that again, if we have to bring in food from outside of the country, that could be a security issue as well. So uh, the child tax credit, that, that's a great example also of something I think that, that helps small businesses uh, as well. I mean, I'll just say personally, so it's a pleasant surprise to get that in my bank account uh, the middle of every month, uh, you know, for the last few months. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's it's it, the, I think the interesting thing about uh, credits like that or stimulus checks or whatever, whatever you, you call them is that when it goes to, uh, you know, middle class, you know, people in the community take it and they spend it in their community and they're spending it on small businesses. I mean, sure, you know, they're, they're going to take some of it and, and go to the you know, the supermarket that's owned by a big chain and yeah. you know, and, and buy necessities. But, you know, they, they are going to go to the local restaurant, the, 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 the local store and and spend it there in their local community. And that's I think, you know, it's it's a it's, it's a cycle that really works. No, you're absolutely right. And if you look at tax benefits for wealthy Americans, they're not going to spend in the local store. Because that they all you know they're fine there. It's going to go into more esoteric uh, investments or purchases and et cetera. And it's not going to be seen as dramatically as quickly in the economy. The economists have a term for that. It's called marginal propensity to consume. And it's a unreformed. I taught economics at West Point, not very well. Right, but, yeah. And it the marginal. <laughs> don't, don't play this all short, sir. <laughs> but the marginal propensity to consume is higher at lower incomes and middle incomes than it is at upper income. Particularly in products that we, when you're talking about food, when you're talking about automobiles, when you're talking about, you know, uh, used cars, things like that. Vacation trips to Disney World, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Sort of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, excellent points. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, one last topic that our members, uh, one of our members is really passionate about, but several of our members have brought it up. And, and I, and I brought it up with Senator Whitehouse because this is kind of his pet thing. So I, I hope we can get you to, to agree and sign on with it. Is, uh, is the, is the removal of daylight savings, uh, oh, change every year. <laughs> so, you have, you have any thoughts on that? Are you just, I, no, I, uh, I must confess, I have not thought about that recently, um, but um, I, I have an arcane bit of knowledge uh, is that uh, it was years ago established like where the line would be by the general counsel, I think, of the Department of Transportation, because in the old days, the railroads were the ones that, you know, they, they depended upon the, the, the time zones and all that stuff. Uh, but I don't have any enlightened thoughts about that. Uh, well, when you, when uh, it's coming up on the sixth uh, to to turn your clock back an hour, when that happens and it's really dark at four thirty, think about uh, small I, businesses would like that not to happen. Small businesses right. think no, that the that is good input. Like, that, that's yeah. good input. I'm glad you know. Again, the advantage of being in Rhode Island, you can talk to knowledgeable people and get some good insights. And all I know exactly. is fall back, spring forward. That's all I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's enough to keep you on time. And I think that's, that's a very important thing in life. So, uh, so uh, that was all the questions we had from our members. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation. I, I always enjoy talking with you, Senator Reid. It's, it's always educational and, and really enlightening. And, and do you have anything you'd like to close with? Anything uh, to end with? Well, I, again, I want to salute what you've done personally, but also the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition very effective in terms of communicating in a very reasonable and very thoughtful way the concerns of business throughout the state. Without that voice, you know, even well-intentioned, we, we would not have been as responsive to the needs uh, of the community. And, you know, we say this, but the backbone of, of our economy are small businesses. Uh, they employ the greatest number of people. They provide the innovation. I was just down at a, a, a store today because uh, next week is the Veterans Small Business Week, celebrating those veterans are in there. But it's an example, again, of uh, creativity, of being able to, after serving your country, walking in and establishing a, a good future for yourself and your family. And so we have to do all we can to small, support small business. and. Uh, and give them a sort of an even playing field against some of these big, big competitive enterprises that are growing and growing and growing. So I want to, th again, thank you for what you've done, David. It's been a pleasure to work with you over these years, and I look forward to continuing to do that. I, I appreciate that. Thank you again for your time today, Senator. Thank you for this great conversation. Uh, ladies you. and gentlemen, this was uh, United States Senator Jack Reed. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So there, there's another episode for you. I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that conversation. That was one of my, one of my favorite conversations. Always great to talk with the senator. Uh, we've got uh, coming up on November 16th, North Providence Mayor Lombardi. On November 30th, Johnston Mayor Policina. And on December 14th, Warwick Mayor Picozzi. So if you are a small business in one of those towns, uh, cities, if you'd like to send us your questions, please do. Go to rismallbusiness.org, sign up for the newsletter, and in email info at rismallbusiness.org. Thank you again for watching. We appreciate it. Take care.